You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to Courage to Overcome with your host, Cheryl Jennings. Each week, Cheryl will feature and discuss the many challenges of those living with disabilities, along with the various issues that are faced by their families that are caring for them. So now, please welcome the host of Courage to Overcome, Cheryl Jennings. This is Cheryl Jennings, your host, and I am so delighted that we have this time that we can visit tonight about some of the courage that it takes to overcome some of the things that can happen later in life, like multiple sclerosis. And I had, I know we've had a couple of people that have talked about this and how it affected their lives, but we've had, got someone tonight that is actually a school teacher. And as I was visiting with her about some of the issues that and challenges that she faces, you know, how do you handle this when you're around kids all the time? And you know that they have a lot of questions. They're very observant. They want to know everything that happens. And it made me think, you know, how it was when I was having my son early in life and how how many times the people that were the hardest to explain things to were adults. And yet, Kids just want to know the answer. They just want to know the answer to the question they ask, not a whole long list of answers that don't affect what they're asking. And I thought, you know, how interesting it is that we have teachers that have to deal with the very same challenges that a lot of our kids are going to have throughout life. And we've talked about some of those issues that have affected kids very young, but we haven't really talked about how do you continue to have a job that requires a lot of movement, being around other people. And so tonight we're going to focus a little bit on some of the real life experiences that might happen if you happen to be diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And as you know, on this program, we're looking for people that have exempt have exemplary lives in dealing with the courage it takes to overcome the challenges that they're facing. And many times we're looking for huge things to happen to say someone's courageous. And I just think when people are able to deal with the circumstances that are difficult for them, that we can know that they are courageous in dealing with life as it happens for them. And so tonight we're going to talk a little bit about that. But before we start, I just want to help open your mind just a little bit to think about there are many people that might be on television that you don't even know have this problem. MS affects men and women. And we have people that are out there doing every kind of uh, they're champions in every field there is, if it's in sports, in music, in the arts, in literature, or whatever it is. There are people out there that you just might, may not be aware that they are dealing with something like MS in their lives, and yet they're continuing to go on and to face those challenges day in and day out. But before we get too far into this, I want to welcome my guest, Amy Kirkpatrick Young, and she is a teacher in the school system, and I know Amy personally, and I just was delighted to get to spend some time visiting with her and just asking her questions, and she said she'd be willing to come on and talk about this, and I thought that's great because I know a lot of people that might know her would love to know 
what it's like to have to deal with MS and then what how does it challenge your life? And so welcome tonight, Amy. I appreciate you coming on and being my guest. Well, thank you, Cheryl. I'm excited for the opportunity. Well, I know that that when you have some kind of a challenge uh, that you're facing personally, a lot of times you might notice people stare, look at you, ask you questions that maybe seem like they're being nosy. And sometimes those problems that we have, and I know when I had, a, my son was very young with cerebral palsy, there are a lot of symptoms that he had that just made it look like maybe I wasn't a very good parent, or maybe I wasn't taking good care of him, and that wasn't at all the what was going on. It was a matter of some of the symptoms are just very obvious for people to see, okay, I have a challenge and I'm dealing with it. Do you ever have people that come mm-hmm. up and ask you questions about anything yeah. that, that yeah. they notice? I, I do, actually. It's, it's kind of funny that you bring that up right uh, right away because that's probably one of my biggest pet peeves, and yet it's also made me very aware of how I uh, interact with people that I see out and about who, who maybe have an obvious disability. Um, one of the things that happens to me often is um, if I'm at the mall or I'm at Walmart um, or the grocery store, um, complete strangers, people that I do not know at all, um, will ask, they'll come up to me and ask me, um, what did you do to your leg? Or how did you hurt your <laughs> knee? That's a pretty common one is how did you hurt your knee? And, um, it depends on what kind of mood I'm in that day. Um, <laughs> or, or how, um, maybe how sincere they seem in their question as to how I respond to them. Um, if, if they seem pretty sincere, I, I usually tell them, um, oh no, I'm not hurt. I have MS. And I can tell usually if they've ever heard of it before, because if they have heard of it, they'll, they'll be, they acknowledge it in a way that indicates they understand. If they've never heard of it before, they kind of just gave me an, oh, okay. Um, if I'm <laughs> feeling particularly uh, ornery, uh, I, I will, you know, sometimes make up some story or I will just say, Um, there's nothing wrong with me, you know, what do you mean Uh, type of thing and just kind of keep going. Um, Because I I, I just feel, now if it's someone who is, who knows me, but who maybe doesn't know that I deal with MS, um, and I have that happen quite a bit, um, being out on the baseball field with my son or in a gym with my daughter, um, you know, parents that I see at sporting events, um, and they may not realize that I have that. And so naturally, because my kids are athletic, they probably assume that I've done something athletic related. But um, the sad thing is that that's never going to happen again. And um, so I usually I usually make a jokes about it, you know, and kind of just be lighthearted um, about the question. But I will say that MS is one of those diseases, like a lot of autoimmune diseases, that um, – so many of the symptoms are hidden or they're inside your body and they don't always exhibit themselves on the outside. And um, I think that's really important to remember for everyone is that you, you really don't know what other people are dealing with um, because what they may be dealing with on a daily basis may not be able to be seen from the outside. Um, that's just something that I've tried to remember whenever I'm around other people in public is that, you know, I, I don't always know what those other people are having to deal with and their struggles. And I just need to be kind. I just need to be kind, you know, to everyone. Um, That's a great point. And, and I'm glad that you brought that up because a lot of times people just assume everybody else has got it easier than they do. And, you know, they may be yes. dealing with a death in the family or something that you don't know anything about and they're very sad. And yet they may not want to talk about it that day or they may need somebody to talk to them and let them just have a good cry. But, you know, we don't always know what yes. the other person is going through. And the thing that I loved about visiting with you is knowing that when you are dealing with this, that you are going to 
be able to understand if one of your students has a challenge maybe in reading or they're a little bit behind some of the others. Mm -hmm. You're going to have more understanding about some of the challenges that they face. And have well, you noticed? I, I would hope so. Yes, I, I, I hope I, I hope that I, I do. I feel like with um, it, it's it's been eight years since I was officially diagnosed, and I feel like I'm a much more tolerant person now than I ever was before. I'm not sure if that has come with age and experience, or if that's come as a result um, of having to deal with a chronic disease. I. I have been uh, very open with my students over the past few years um, I, as I've done different treatments um, for MS. It's, some of it's required me to be out of school. And so I've tried to be, you know, open with them about, you know, what, what's happening. And it, you were right in what you said in your earlier comments. They, 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 they care, but they don't – they're not – a they're concerned with their own lives and really how is how is what I'm going through going to affect them. So I don't burden them with, you know, things that, that they don't really need to know. I just kind of want them to be aware of, you know, I, I may drop papers every now and again. Um, you got to keep your backpacks shoved under your desk because I'm going to trip over them. You know, the, those are things that are going to happen. And they're, they're usually, I'm surprised but they can be very caring just by knowing a little bit about what I have going on. And I even know that the things they have going on, I feel touched that they would even show some, some sympathy towards what I have when I know that they are dealing with so much too, you know, things that right. may be happening at home or relationships, those type of things. Well, and, and all of the kids come with their own baggage, and we don't always know if we, even if we're teachers, we don't always know what is happening before they got there, what keeps them mm -hmm. from being able to participate in some things, or, you know, just what they're going to deal with when they go back home again. And I've heard lots and lots of stories, but I love the fact that when you're open with the uh, students, that they can be very supportive of you. And I know mm -hmm. I have a I have a friend that was dealing with cancer, and she kept teaching right up to the very end. And some days she went with fever, and I go, Lisa, you shouldn't do that. You're going to get sicker. And she'd go, no, the kids know I'm dealing with this. And she just kind of put it off, but she loved the kids so much. And I know you love your kids so much. You want to be there to support them oh, yes. every way that you can. And, you know, that's – that's a sign of a great teacher and also just being able to be open about saying, yes, I have something to deal with. A lot of people find that very difficult to do, and yet it would be a lot easier if, you know, sometimes it would be easier if we just knew they're dealing with a challenge that we just weren't aware of so that people mm -hmm. would treat them yes. nicer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. You you're exactly right. And I I I feel like keeping on doing the things that you enjoy help to keep you from I guess focusing on the negative things that that you have no control over, you know? Um right. I can control getting up and going to school every day and um, doing the things that I, I need to do. And I can control how I react to my students and how I spend my time. I cannot control this disease. I have zero control over it. It has complete control over me in, in what it does to my body, but I have control over how I react to that. So I guess by, that is I guess a by beautiful statement. <laughs> Well, I guess by continuing to do the things that I love, then I'm able to have some control in my life when I have no control over the disease. Right. Oh, well, this is just going to be a wonderful program tonight. We do need to take our first break, <laughs> and the time will go very fast. So if you've got friends, call them real quick, tell them to tune in, and we will be right back after our first commercial. 
psychologist, master certified coach, and CEO of the executive and organizational development firm, True North Leadership, Dr. Relly Nadler brings his expertise in emotional intelligence to keynotes, consulting, coaching, and training. He is the author of Leader's Playbook and Leading with Emotional Intelligence that lays out tips and tools for effective leadership. Dr. Nadler has designed multi-day executive boot camps for high achievers in Fortune 500 companies and has coached CEOs, presidents and their staff, and developed and delivered innovative leadership programs for such organizations as Anheuser-Busch, BMW, MCI, EDS, DreamWorks Animation, the U.S. Navy, and Vanguard Health Systems. To learn more and get your free iPhone app highlighting his tools with videos, leadership keys, visit www.truenorthleadership.com today. Joseph A. Moylan is the owner of Ion Health, which specializes in very unique medical devices. Ion Health offers biomats, alkalife, and frequency machines. Biomats are a far infrared and negative ion emitting FDA approved medical device. With many different sizes available, you can place them on your bed, on a massage table, or on a seat in your car. It is an unobtrusive way to health. Alkalife machines are water ionizers that cleanse and raise the alkalinity of your tap water, making high alkaline water. Frequency machines utilize certain frequencies to kill viruses and bacteria. These devices are safe and effective. Coming from a health-conscious background and studying physiology at the Academy of Natural Health, Joseph A. Moylan has 15 years of experience in the health field and wants to help you live a healthy, long life. Visit www.ionhealthbiomats.weebly.com or call 765-520-2988. Don't let your health go astray. Get in touch today. All right. Uh, While we're talking tonight, Amy and I are just visiting about some of the symptoms of MS. And absolutely, if you've got a question that you are curious about or want to ask, you know, it's okay. Our number to call in is 866-451-1451. Again, that's 866-451-1451. One four five one, and we were just visiting too. That one of the uh, most famous people that we've heard in the last few months that announced that he had MS was Montel, and uh, he has a TV program. And uh, honestly, there are people in every walk of life that will be affected by MS, and you know that is just something that I think. As we're starting this tonight, it would be good to explain, first of all, Amy, how did you know to go to the doctor and how did he know what kind of symptoms this was leading him to try to diagnose this problem? Because it looks like there are so many symptoms listed that could affect, you know, lots of different uh, disabilities or different problems that people have. So how did you know to go to the doctor? (laughs) <laughs> well, I wish I could say I, I wish I could say that it was an easy decision, but it it, it really wasn't. And I, I do have to give an extremely large amount of credit to my family doctor who I who I did see initially because he, uh, upon hearing my symptoms, knew exactly what to do. Um, but but first of all, what I guess um, I noticed specifically was. a a complete numbness on the whole right side of my body. Now, I still had all of my capabilities as far as movement, but um, it it was the equivalent of feeling like you have a bandage on, almost like a Band-Aid, and then that feeling of when you touch your skin with the Band-Aid on, and you can feel the sensation, but it's an entirely different sensation. That's how I felt from the tip of my head all the way down to my feet, just on the right side of my body. And my my right arm and hand um, tingled, and uh, my right leg and feet the same way. They they just kind of tingled. They worked, but they just had the very odd sensation. Um, I was young. um, You know, I was 32 years old. I had two small children. I had a two-year-old and a six-year-old. And I was teaching, um, just very busy, really didn't have time to be bothered um, with 
making an appointment, getting a substitute for school, you know, making arrangements or picking up my kids or, you know, whatever. Um, but at the urging of my husband and um, another close friend, they they were concerned, um, you know, that you might want to go check, get this checked out. This isn't normal. And um, I hadn't even, you know, gotten on Google and did a little search of my symptoms. I hadn't even done that yet. Uh, I, I know that's pretty common of what people might do which I don't recommend that because that'll scare you. But um, I made an appointment and I went in and uh, talked to my family practice doctor and, and I thought I needed to go see a chiropractor. I thought my back was out of whack and something was pinched and that was causing the numbness. And um, I even thought maybe I had some carpal tunnel because of the problem with my, my hand and my arm. And he listened to everything I said. And, and then, um, he kind of surprised me because he said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get you scheduled for an MRI and we're going to get you an appointment with a neurologist. And I said, okay. And, um, he said, well, we're going to, we're going to get those done very quickly. Um, which that kind of scared me just a little bit, but he, he didn't tell me what he thought it was. He didn't anything. He just said, here's what we're going to do. So, I went that afternoon for an MRI um, of the brain, and I remember very distinctly lying there in that tube um, just thinking, please, and praying, please, God, not to be a tumor, because that was my greatest fear, is that there was a tumor on my brain causing some of this, you know, some of these problems. Um, I have the MRI, I go home, and um, my doctor calls me that evening at home and said, I don't, I hate to tell you this over the phone, but he said, the radiologist called me, and he read your MRI, and it looks like you have a textbook case of MS. And I said, what's that? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And um, he told me uh, that it was multiple sclerosis. Uh, And I said, really? I had never heard of it. I had no just, I mean, I was completely broadsided, I guess. Um, anyway, he finished a conversation and he said, you're young, you're going to be fine. I'm going to get you with the best neurologist that I can. And he said, it, it'll be okay. So, um, I started doing a little research and, um, I remembered the prayer that I had in that MRI tube about, I hope it's not a tumor. And I thought, well, it's not a tumor, so I can do this. <laughs> you know, once I found out it, it's, it wasn't terminal, it was, you know, just something that had to be dealt with. I said, okay, here we go. And, um, that was the beginning, the beginning. Uh, and I was very fortunate to get with a, a very, very good neurologist. He's still the best one in the state of Oklahoma. Dr. Pardo, he heads up the Oklahoma MS Center for Excellence. He's at the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation in Oklahoma City. Um, And he remains my neurologist. I would recommend him to anyone. He is very difficult to get into. It takes a couple of months usually for an initial appointment. When I saw him, and um, it it took about six weeks to get in to see him um, for that first appointment, but he did you know, his initial tests that he does, and I had to have another MRI and things like that. Um, And basically, yes, I had a textbook case of MS. I had a few small lesions uh, in my brain. Um, I would find out later, within about a year, we went ahead and did an MRI on my spine, and I actually have several more lesions or Scars, that's where the sclerosis name comes from, um, on my spine. And it's because of those that I have the majority of the problems that I do have is because of the ones in my spine. You know, the spinal column is so narrow um, that the nerve sensors have less of a way to adapt to damage. Whereas in the brain, if a nerve sensor is damaged, it's there's room to where it can it can find a way usually it can 
you know, go around or go under, and it can help make that connection. But in the spine, the space is so narrow that often the damage that's done, there's no way for the nerve to re to kind of reroute itself. Um, it's just kind of stuck there. So that's kind of the unfortunate part about my particular situation. I know that there are people who um, who go undiagnosed many for long time, sometimes months or years, um, maybe because their symptoms are not as noticeable or maybe they, they, they go to the ER um, and perhaps those doctors are not thinking that, that it could be MS. I will say that I think doctors have become more aware of it in the past 10 years and I think that they're more attuned to it now than they ever were before just because it's kind of becoming something that more and more people are diagnosed with. Um, I would say that if you have a, a numbness or a tingling in any part of your body, or if you have a sudden vision change, um, or you notice that you don't have the balance that you used to, um, there's lots of different things like that that kind of all play into having MS. Now, those things can also mean... Wow other diseases as well. So it's, it's, it's hard to pinpoint one or the other. And that's sometimes why, um, simply a doctor's visit. And then it may, it may take an MRI to actually make the diagnosis back a long time ago. Um, before MRIs were as exact as they are now, it would often involve like a, a spinal tap. And I believe that's, I've never had one, but I understand that those are quite painful, um, but that used to be how they would diagnose MS, and thankfully they have better technology to where that diagnosis can be made without having to go through something like that. Um, now I see my neurologist twice a year. Um, I have an MRI done once a year, and thankfully I've not had any new lesions or new scars uh, in in the eight years that I've been diagnosed, thankfully wow. the treatment, yeah, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Yes, um, the disease progression has been halted by treatment. Um, the disability progression has continued. That means that the damage that was done initially when I had the initial attack, that damage those nerves that were initially, um, I guess, damaged at the beginning have continued to deteriorate or to die off, and so those have created their own problems. But all of that's completely normal, and that's just kind of part of, of how it goes. But thankfully, with the medication that the FDA has approved and that they're always researching new things and and there's always something on the back burner that's you know going through clinical trials um there's a lot of options for people with ms 20 years ago there weren't this many options so at my age i'm 40 i'm 40 this year i think within my lifetime i think they'll have a cure i really do oh that'd be great so you know it's You've brought out so many things, and a lot of people may be dealing with some symptoms, and they just never have thought about really going to a doctor that could really diagnose, you know, what's what's there. Now, some of the things that you've mentioned could mean it's a different kind of problem, and we're not trying to, you know, diagnose everybody here, but rather... I think what you've brought out is it's important to get an early diagnosis, not sit and wait and wait and wait and think it's going to go away while things get worse. Because as you were telling me about the lesions, once that happens, Mm -hmm. didn't you say it won't regenerate anymore to be new? That's just the damage that's been done. Yes, which is why, which is why it's so important to get that diagnosis, to get started on a course of treatment, because if you would do not have a medication, you're, you're simply opening yourself up 
for the possibility of more and more lesions. And that's the absolute thing that you don't want because that's one of those things that we can't control. And um, the early early diagnosis is is key. And and like I mentioned um, earlier in the program, I really do credit m- my doctor for um, being so aware of that because I had. I went in having absolutely no clue. Now, if he didn't have any clue as to what MS was or that the this was a possibility, I don't know that he would have suggested that. He may have just sent me home with um, a steroid pack or, um, you know, maybe referred me to a chiropractor. I'm not sure what he would have done necessarily, but I feel well, like he was definitely the one that got yeah. the whole ball rolling. And the good thing is you did have a good doctor that could absolutely jump right on it and get you to uh, an expert, mm-hmm. you know, in this particular area. And I'm a believer in going to somebody that deals with it every day. If you have a problem, yes. find somebody that absolutely can help. Once again, I want to give out our number if anyone has a question or you want to make a comment. Maybe you've got MS, but our number is 866 866- Four five one one four five one. This is um, courage to overcome, and we are really hearing someone with courage to deal with MS. We will take another break, and when we come back, we'll find out a little bit more. Certified professional coach Pamela Reeves can help you with your relationships. Motivational and image coaching are just some of the ways she can help you enhance all aspects of your life. Her book, Is It Love or Merely a Sick Attachment?, helps readers clearly distinguish healthy, loving relationships from toxic ones. Ms. Reeves has put her words into action through Ray of Hope Kenya, an international initiative that provides outreach to victims of abusive relationships there with the goal of helping them rebuild their lives and the tools to avoid abuse. Ms. Reeves operates various businesses interest through her umbrella network, Nella LLC, and credits her success to her diverse work experience. Whatever your goals, whether striking a balance, reinventing your image, or simply lifting your lifestyle, Pamela Reeves will help you achieve them. Your life, your call. Dial 410-902-5715 or email Pamela at pamreg01 at verizon.net. She's also on the web at pamreeves.com and on Twitter at Pamela underscore Reeves. America is out of control. Today's capitalism and the approach to money is in fact the symptom of a more widespread pattern of excessive behavior. In his book, The Culture of Excess, How America Lost Self-Control and Why We Need to Redefine Success, clinical psychologist Dr. Jay Slosar portrays an America where excess fuels the drive to succeed. Dr. Slosar examines the cultural factors that lead to excess ranging from obesity to fraud to pervasive budget deficits. His book examines the powerful economic and social factors and their impact on our psychological well-being. Dr. Slosar explores the psychological impact of increasing narcissism, perfectionism, self-destruction, and our identity confusion. He offers recommendations for helping Generation Me become Generation We. Those who resist Slosar's message will want to avoid his discussion of regulation and his recent message that at this point, democracy must be more important than today's capitalism. Get his book now online or by visiting thecultureofexcess.com. All right. Well, we're learning a lot about the importance of early diagnosis when you have an issue. And this really goes across the board with whatever you're seeing. I mean, even if it's a child of yours that you see something is not right, maybe they're not walking right or talking right. There's something that doesn't seem right. Take them in and get the doctors to see if there is something that can be dealt with, because even with some of the issues that our children may have when they're born or when they're very young are problems that need to be dealt with early and not wait until later. And, you know, many times in the past, people would think, oh, don't worry about that till they're school age. Well, things have changed, folks. There are so many ways now that people can get diagnosis, learn what they can do that can maybe make a huge difference and turn a life around. And tonight we're talking with Amy about MS and how it's affected her life, how she got 
her diagnosis and how it's made a big difference in being able to prevent the disease from continuing to ravage the body because once it's done made these lesions as she's explained it's something that can't be regenerated but it's prevented more and more of that happening and if she had waited five more years to be diagnosed she might have many more challenges to deal with and so uh, really I'd like for you to talk to us a little bit about this Amy and how does it make a difference in your life how do you deal with some of these things and do you need help to do things or do you just have to give yourself more time or you know how do you deal with the sure. issues that you have? Sure. Um, and that's that's probably a, a major question that someone may have um, if they're if they know someone with MS, wondering, you know, how how they could help them. Um, one thing I think it's important to remember is that every single person who has MS or any chronic illness um no two people are alike um, as far as their their disabilities or in um, uh, their their tolerance of of certain things. Um, I will say that probably my biggest struggle um, is quite simply walking. Uh, unfortunately, my uh, my right leg and foot uh, do not necessarily work in, as they should. Um, it it um, Often it takes quite a bit of concentration, I guess, on my part to uh, make my leg walk normally and my foot to pick up and put down like it's supposed to. I have found that that is greatly determined by how tired I am. Um, you know, there's there's tired and then there's MS tired, uh, which is... The, the MS fatigue is a pretty big deal. Most most people who have MS have a, some level of fatigue, and it's it's not just the tired you might feel at the end of the day when you've had a long day. It's it's a lot more it's a lot more than that. It's almost hard to explain, but it's like your your brain's in a fog, and your everything about you is like being weighed down. By bricks, and so if you think about having to move like that, it, it can be quite difficult. Um, so when my day starts uh, every morning, you know, I I kind of think of it as in, okay, what do I have to do today? What things have to get done, and then what things are just maybes, meaning at by the time I get home from school, you know, take pick kids up from practice, get somebody to a ball game, whatever, what am I going to feel like doing at that point? And those are things I just kind of have to sometimes wait and see. Um, I try to be really careful whenever I'm uh, even in my own house as far as, like, making sure that I don't trip over things. I have to really pay attention, like, in door thresholds when I'm going in and out of my house or going in and out of my school or any, any other place I need to run an errand, I'm always conscious of what the ground is like to try to pay attention to things that I could trip on. Because I, I mentioned that my foot, my right foot doesn't pick up when it should, like most normal people would just by instinct. Um, I, I kind of have to think it <laughs> to pick up. Um, so I'm always kind of aware of that. My classroom in my high school is, it, it's a pretty good distance from the main office and like the teacher workroom where the copiers are. Um, I usually only make that trek once a day from my classroom to the office or the copy room and then, and then back. Um, it's not always the getting there that's difficult, but sometimes it's the getting back. And not that it's that far, but after a, you know, a couple of hours of maybe standing up, teaching, you know, walking around my classroom, um, you know, bending down to help a student at, you know, by their desk or this and that, um, I, I do start to notice, you know, my muscles are getting tired, um, before noon usually. And so I just kind of have to be aware. I have a stool at the front of my classroom behind my podium, and, and I'll sit down on that. Um, I will, you know, lean against the desk. Um, 
balance is one of my bigger struggles. And I will use, if you ever see me standing, you will usually see me standing and leaning against something, a chair or a wall or a door frame, just because it, that helps to um, kind of keep me from swaying and it helps to kind of keep my lib- equilibrium a little bit more stable. <clears throat> it's, it's really interesting when, uh, like, I'd, I'd, I don't look backwards very often, like over my shoulder, because the the turning back around with my head will really mess with my equilibrium. And I think that's pretty common with, with people um, who have MS. Uh, sometimes vertigo can kind of right. kick in there. And well, so that and makes I was... it a little bit... I was reading something about when you move your head, sometimes it feels like electrical shocks or buzzing can be something that people could feel. And, uh, you know, that would be real irritating, much less, you know, if you if you know that's going to happen, you're going to try to avoid it. (laughs) Yeah. And you think about when you're driving a car. Um, you know, we have rear view mirrors and those are great, but to be perfectly safe, you might want to look back over your, your left shoulder, um, you know, before you pull out. Well, I I just, I realized I can't do that too fast (laughs) because that doesn't, that doesn't always work out well for, um, my vision when I turn back around. Um, my overall reaction time is slower, and I don't know, I've, I've talked to other people who have MS, and they've, they've mentioned that, too, as far as, like, playing catch with my son who plays baseball. Um, I, I really have to pay attention because my reaction time for moving to a ball or away from a ball is, is slower than a lot of people's would. Um, I probably should use a cane or some sort of help device. I guess I'm a little too stubborn for that just yet. So I don't, I don't use one. Um, I have one. I have a couple of walking sticks that I might use if we go out, you know, on a hike or something. But I know anytime I'm in public and my husband's with me, he he usually takes my arm uh, because he knows that, you know, especially when I'm around other people, I may be too focused on talking and less focused on <laughs> walking or paying attention to, you know, the, the ground. And um, it's pretty easy for me to stumble, you know, and, and fall. And, and sadly, that, that has happened more times than I care to admit. Um, I've never hurt <laughs> myself. It's just my pride, you know, is usually the the, the biggest thing there. I, I think I... Um, I think as far as like disability type things, that's pretty much it for me. But I've, I've had other people tell me that, you know, they, they struggle with, um, oh, just, uh, sometimes like a weakness more in their arms than in their legs. Um, I know that there's a lot of anything that has a nerve in your body can be affected by MS. So you may have a lot of things internally that, don't go don't don't work right anymore because they have nerves and they were perhaps damaged by some sort of an attack or episode that you may have had maybe when a medication wasn't working or before someone was was diagnosed um i just i, I know that the eyes can be affected by ms and of course losing losing your vision would be probably the absolute worst thing that i can imagine well, that's always one of my fears uh, is that my eyes will be affected, but thankfully they, they have not. But I know that that's one way that people um, have explained to me that, that they've known something was wrong was um, had to do with their vision, maybe uh, losing vision in one eye or all of a sudden getting being blurry. Um, that's one of the things that seems to be kind of a tip off that it could be MS. Well, so and I of, was... I was reading, too, that, you know, sometimes it causes um, short-term memory problems, forgetfulness, or slow word recall. And I don't have MS, but I got those problems, too, <laughs> you know, with fibromyalgia. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of, there's a lot of overlap of some of the issues that can be dealt with, but it sounds like you've really got 
of the things that you need to do, you figured out how to keep on making that happen. And I know your family has been very attentive, but has been there for you in the fact that you would mention your husband taking your arm and and knowing that that's going to be hard to walk and talk. You know, I just think that's mm-hmm. a wonderful thing that that the family can just look after each other. Have you noticed yes, that the and, kids and, are doing that? Go ahead. Yes, and and I have I have, well I have to say that um, my entire family has been very supportive since this whole thing happened, and I feel like anyone out there who who has MS who has at least one person, and it may not be their spouse, it may not be a close family member, but just a friend um, who can be there when life gets really difficult. I think it's so important to being able to deal with this. Oh, absolutely. Well, we're going to take one more break, and when we come back, we'll try to find a way to bring this to a close, but this has been a wonderful uh, time that we've spent visiting about this, but we'll be back in just a moment. For over 50 years, Evelyn Stapula has been a loving advocate for people with disabilities throughout the state of Pennsylvania. President and founder of Big Heart Bridges, her organization actively campaigns for legislation and support of civil liberties that meet the needs of disabled individuals with housing, transportation, and employment. Ms. Stapula has joined forces with a variety of esteemed organizations that advocate for the disabled. She serves on the board of the United Cerebral Palsy of Pittsburgh and the Governor's Cabinet and Advisory Committee for People with Disabilities, and she is a consultant for the Pennsylvania Governor's Conference for Women. Her many efforts have led to the implementation of a transportation program for the disabled with the Access Paratransit System of Allegheny County. Evelyn Stapula strives daily to serve the interests of the disabled, to protect their freedoms, and enable them to live normal public lifestyles. To learn more, please call 412-491-2605 or email Evelyn at ers92645 at verizon.net. Do you battle with weight loss? There is a solution. Founder of Weight No More Consulting, Deborah Simons, can help you lose weight safely and effectively through weight loss surgery. I know. I had the surgery two years ago, and I am 135 pounds lighter and medication-free. This full-service weight loss center caters to your every need as you navigate to a healthy weight following surgery. Servicing all of Canada, Weight No More Consulting takes pride in its compassionate care and guides you through each step before and after surgery. Starting with informational meetings, Weight No More Consulting educates each potential client before they decide to have surgery on the health risks of obesity and the various weight loss surgeries available. After surgery, Weight No More Consulting provides a solid support system with ongoing meetings to ensure continued success. Deborah Simons and Weight No More Consulting are committed to promoting your health and wellness through maintaining a healthy weight for life. All right. This has just been a wonderful program tonight to learn how one of my friends who's a teacher in high school has been able to deal with multiple sclerosis and also educate her kids in understanding more about other people who have challenges. And, you know, sometimes we overlook the fact that our kids know a lot. They do understand a lot. And sometimes we don't challenge them to live up to being courageous and being kind to people and just not being um, the kind of person that would be a bully to people that have some kind of a challenge that they're dealing with. And I know with our own son having uh, cerebral palsy that there were lots of young people in his life that when he would be in a Bible class or in a schoolroom, that they would get through with their work real quickly so that they could go over and help him. And that's part of why I hope that this program is helping people to understand kindness is always Great. It doesn't matter what the problem is that you're dealing with. It's understanding that people have problems that maybe you don't have that makes it harder for them to do what you're doing or whatever they're doing. And in this case, for Amy to be a teacher and for her to continue to go and to know day by day that she's going to have challenges to deal with, but she's still going to keep on doing everything that she can, shows me what a courageous person she is in overcoming a challenge that's really a great big challenge. 
but also to be on a program and help us understand some of the challenges she faces. I, I appreciate that so much, Amy, because you've given us a lot of good information tonight to understand more about this particular issue, but also in helping us just understand more people uh, that have a challenge and how important it is to get those early diagnoses, to learn everything you can about what you're dealing with or what your family's dealing with so that you can find the appropriate ways to get treatments, to be the best kind of treatment out there. And I love the fact that you have hope that this is going to have an answer in your lifetime because there are lots of challenges out there that we need to have answers for in order to help people to have better lives and to be able to be more productive. And I just, I wanted to just thank you too for helping us understand how important the family is and giving you support to deal with the issues that you deal with on a day to day. And, you know, how do your kids uh, deal with some of these issues? Do you ever, do they ever say anything about it being hard for them or have they just, They've been so young as they were growing up. They've just learned to deal with it, and it's no big deal. Well, I think, you know, they were quite young when I was initially diagnosed. Um, of course, they've kind of grown up as my, um, some of my disabilities have progressed. I, I, I know that um, they are very watchful. They're very protective. And whenever we are out, um, you know, doing things and um, – it's just me and one of them or me and both of them. I, I have two children um, that that they're always making sure that they kind of step into that role that my husband usually plays as far as, you know, making sure that they take my arm when we're stepping up over a curb um, or, you know, just making sure to to get the door and to point out, Mom, that rug is 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 tipped up there you know just pointing out little things because they know oh, that good. i do have a tendency to, to to trip and fall um and my, my son who's, who's 10 um he he really it, it it amazes me because he really steps up to the plate in those type of situations especially when it's just me and him um and he won't let me go anywhere you know by myself like down the down the aisle at walmart or whatever he's always right there and i i know that they are I know that they are slightly, can be slightly embarrassed, um, and I try really hard not to, I try to be as normal as possible uh, when I'm out (laughs) in public with them, (laughs) Um, and um, they have insisted that I not use a cane um, or any sort of walking device, and so I've tried to honor their wishes with that uh, until it becomes an absolute necessity. But through this, we have had lots of spontaneous conversations, never planned, but just spontaneous conversations about being aware of other people and challenges that that they may have. Um, I will say that, you know, my kids aren't necessarily phased by seeing someone in a wheelchair, um, someone who's, you know, wearing some sort of a a brace or, you know, some sort of anything on their body that seems to be helping them to get around they you know it's just Take it it's just stride. not something that yeah. it's, it's just part part of it and i think that that's important to just the the just the knowledge that there are people who are different than us and that's okay they're still just people like we are and we can you know just we're all uh, the same. We're all the same. We just may look different on the outside. And that's so true. We all are different. Uh, if you would, if somebody wanted to write you a note and just visit with you, do you have an email address that they might sure. write to you? Okay. Yes, I do. And that email address is A, the letter A, A Young, that's Y O U N G, 7201 at gmail.com. That's my personal email. I check that every day, and I would welcome any questions, or if someone just wants to tell me their experiences. Um, you know, I, I've, I've heard a lot of people's stories, and I'm sure that there's a lot more that I'll hear, and I'll be happy to, to be a listening ear to anybody who needs that. 
Uh, one of the things we never talked about was the medications, and are they pretty expensive to deal with? I be- yes, they are. Uh, thankfully, I, I have insurance, health insurance, um, but even even for anyone who perhaps needs help with paying for their medication, there are several programs even that I've taken advantage of that have helped to make sure that, that medica- I can get that medication at a very low cost. Oh, that is wonderful. Well, what you've done has really been so helpful tonight, and I appreciate it because people deal with all kinds of issues, and sometimes they just don't even know who to ask a question of, you know, from. They don't understand what's going on if they're having a problem maybe with a foot or with their eyes or muscles or whatever, and so you've opened the door for them to really think twice about getting checked and find out if there's something that they need to deal with. I do want to say that Christmas is coming up, and a lot of people are going to be looking for something to get for somebody that they love. If you've got a caregiver in your family or a friend, someone that you know is trying to be a good caregiver, there's a book on Amazon that I would love for you to get. It's called It Takes Courage to Be a Caregiver. And I put together that book with a lot of information from many different people, from the interviews, personal experiences, caring for a special needs son, as well as helping with parents and in-laws and watching grandparents uh, as one took care of the other. And I know that there are so many questions that people constantly have about how to be a good caregiver. And that's a book I hope you'll think about. And every week at eight o'clock central, nine o'clock Eastern, we'll be on this show, Courage to Overcome. Tell your friends. And I'll look forward to visiting with you again next week. Thanks for tuning in. You've been listening to Courage to Overcome with your host, Cheryl Jennings. Be it Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, or autism, listen each week for an informative look into the lives of those challenged by these and other disabilities today on the next episode of Cheryl Jennings' Courage to Overcome. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.